All right. So our, our guest speaker tonight, I think he photoshopped that from one of my fish. Anyway, uh, we have Jason Swigum here tonight. Uh, Jason, the first time I met or met Jason was a couple of years ago. He did uh, a meeting on when during COVID on Zoom, and it was really interesting. So I'm really looking forward to uh, Jason presenting here tonight. And then I don't have to talk anymore, and I can go sit in the back of the room. So well, if everyone would welcome Jason. Is it working? Can you guys hear me? Awesome. All right. Well, I could stand up and or sit down and listen to talk all night. So that was. <laughs> um. So let's. Is it camera working? You have to stick on me. Uh. So I am Jason Swingin. Um. I'm a fly fishing guide based out of Duluth, Minnesota. Uh. I've been fishing for. Camera is not following me. Cool. All right, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have been, um, so I grew up in Montana. Uh, I get this question all the time when I'm, I'm guiding people, but I did not start fly fishing until I actually moved to Minnesota. So everyone's just like, oh, I was but it was great fishing out there and like, I don't know. So it, I'm sure it is. Um, but I, I moved to Duluth. Um, I'm before I started guiding, I did a lot of web development and internet marketing and I had a lot of, uh, free time and I can make my own schedule. And I built a bunch of websites for some cool, uh, fly fishing businesses. I built a website for a Norwegian, uh, fly fishing club in Norway. Um, uh, let's see, uh, um, the Gala uh, Fishing Club in the Amazon and a bunch of cool stuff. Um, but I moved to Duluth. I started tying flies before I did anything else, mainly for bass, um, then got into um, steelhead flies and then jumped right into steelhead before I really did any other trout fishing or anything like that. Um, so kind of migratory fish is my main uh, background. Um, and then I met a bunch of Cool people up in Duluth. I joined Trout Unlimited, and uh, now I'm the vice president of our local Gitchi Gum Gumi uh, <laughs> chapter. Uh, so now I have the same vice president. is a pretty good role. I need to start coming up with jokes for the beginning of our meetings up in Duluth. Um, but yeah, so now I'm a guide with uh, Namabini, which many of you might have heard of, um, or you have at least heard of Carl Hansel, who uh, recently came up with the Fly Fishing Minnesota book and a map book, and he's a, a pretty popular um, guy in Trout Unlimited and fishing in general. So I get a uh, guide with him, and I'm pretty good friends with him, which is um, fun. Um, so that was a fish that uh, Paul caught, and then I photoshopped it. Oh, and we're just going to zoom right on through all of this and then go watch the football game. Um, let's go back two or three. Okay, yeah, we can go forward one. Yeah, perfect. Um, so this is going to be kind of, um, I'm going to throw a bunch of information out there. Um, hopefully some of it sticks, but I'll go through it quick. Um, if you have questions, we'll try to save it for the end, but if you want to um, get something cleared up, that's fine. So um, I'm based out of Duluth. I fish uh, North Shore and South Shore, uh, mainly migratory fish. So kind of the whole spectrum of this talk is mainly going to be on migratory fish. Uh, but out of the migratory fish, the steelhead are really the ones that we all want to catch. It's kind of the most prolific the coolest fish, the hardest fighting, um, and my personal favorite. So we're mainly going to be talking about steelhead, um, little biology, history, life cycle stuff, um, and then all the nitty gritty, when you should go, where you should go, um, a little bit of nerdy data facts on the current fish numbers, um, because it's not a, uh, a level thing every year, year after year. 
Uh, and then I'll give you some tips on how to read the water, um, some just kind of tips that I've picked up along the way, some gear, flies, uh, all that stuff. Um, I did bring all of my steelhead flies. Uh, well, most of them. I probably still have more at home that my wife doesn't even know about. Um, but at the end, you guys can walk up. I think it'll be a little easier to kind of check them out um, at the end in person. Um, so these are the migratory uh, species of Lake Superior, um, steelhead being the one that we're mainly going to be talking about. Uh, so steelhead is a rainbow trout. Um, the reason it is uh, called a steelhead it is, is, it, is because it is a migratory fish or an anadromous fish. Um, and they originally came from, they're a, a Pacific uh, trout. So they were taken from uh, river tributaries off of California. Um, and I think some on Washington um, and put into Lake Superior along with pretty much all of these different um, fish. So out of the trout in Lake Superior, uh, lake trout and brook trout um, are really the only native trout to Lake Superior. And then all of the rest of these fish, um, steelhead, brown trout, um, coho salmon, king salmon, pink salmon, um, let's see, and then Atlantic salmon, uh, so splake is a hybrid. Uh, they sometimes will be uh, naturally reproducing, but for the most part, Wisconsin will um, stock splake. Um, and then Atlantic salmon were stocked for a while, but they didn't do very good. So Atlantics aren't really a possibility um, of catching, but still has kind of the, the main one. Um, yeah, so quick timeline. I, I kind of already covered that. Um, in the past, it's just lake trout in the lake. And then, um, so the Brule River, most of you are familiar with the, the Brule River in Wisconsin, used to just be brook trout. And it was, everything was kind of working out good. And then they started putting in all these other different fish. Um, so they started stocking, uh, I think it was actually, what was it, 1895 was the first steelhead um, to get stocked into Lake Superior. And then it took about 30, 40 years until the fish started feeling comfortable and they would uh, reproduce on their own. Um, they'd go up in the rivers and they were good until the 1940s um, was, I would think it was 35 when the first sea lamprey eventually made it through all the Great Lakes and then got into Lake Superior. Um, so you can see this graph, um, this is actually lake trout. Um, so this is kind of average lake trout numbers. And then the lamprey came into Lake Superior and they just kind of decimated um, the population. Um, there's not as much research on or graphs on steelhead, but you could just tell this, the, the lamprey was a bad deal for steelhead. Um, the other bad thing with steelhead is it was really good fishing in the 40s and 50s. There was... I don't know if there was no limit or you could keep five fish. I've talked to a lot of guys steelhead in the past. We're like, oh, you can just I'd go to the river and pull out gunny sacks full of steelhead. And then they're like, well, we're all the steelhead. There's no more steelhead anymore. So it's kind of a combination. There's a lot of moving parts, um, but sea lampreys got introduced. It got overfished. Um, then salmon, all your uh, pink salmon, king salmon. Coho's got introduced in the 60s. Um, and then in the 70s, people realized like something's not right. Uh, we need a little more of a boost, something else to um, help people go fishing. So they introduced um, loops, which I can go, I'll go into detail a little bit later, um, but it's a different version of a rainbow trout, um, a landlocked steelhead. Um, and then in the 80s, they uh, built the the weir, um, the lamprey barrier on the Brule River. Um, and I think it was maybe 94, they built the dam on the Knife River on the North Shore. Um, and then in the 90s, they uh, realized that steelhead weren't doing pretty good. So they started adding more regulations. So you um, had to re release any 
fish under 28 inches, any steelhead on the North Shore, and then uh, 26 inches and below all had to get released on the Brule. And then in the 2000s, the North Shore went catch and release only other than the Kamloops. So there's the steelhead. So we'll talk a little bit. We're just going to go through um, a little bit of some um, pictures just because fish are cool and I like seeing fish. So this is a steelhead um, from last fall on the Brule River. Um, okay, go through these. Yeah, so these are both Brule River steelhead. Um, one of the cool things about steelhead um, is that they change colors. So, I mean, obviously, browns are cool. They got and brook trout, all, all the trout are pretty cool. They got all the different colors and stuff. Um, but steelhead, so this one on the right is pretty fresh from the lake. Um, they're often called like chromers, um, silver bullets. They're bright, shiny fish from the lake. And then once they've been in the rivers for a couple weeks, they lose um, the, let's see. So their outer scale um, becomes translucent. So this inside color is always on that fish, um, but then the longer that they've been in the water, that uh, kind of red um, streak and their kind of purpley cheeks start um, showing up. And you can kind of tell how long a fish has been in the river system based on the color. Um, so that was a steelhead um, that Paul Johnson caught last spring. And then I Photoshopped with uh, another guy I knew, so nice steelhead. Um, so, yeah, so this is a, a brown trout from Brule River in Wisconsin. Um, that was just like a week and a half ago, the second to last day of the season. Um, got a nice, um, nice brown trout there. Um, a couple other brown trout from the Brule River. Some nice ones. All right, so this one, um, I I was gonna say like, oh, can anyone say like what these fish are? But you guys are all fishermen, so you would know. So this is, what kind of fish is this? Yeah, so this is a, a coaster. It's a brook trout, um, but it's a big brook trout, which um, pretty much means that it's um, a, a migratory brook trout. Um, so this one was actually caught, like I said, on the Brewer River, in Wisconsin used to just be brook trout. And I'll talk about numbers a little later, but there's almost no migratory brook trout left in the Brule River that they just got kicked out. There's too many steelhead uh, and salmon um, to, to compete with. Um, so this was a North Shore um, coaster brook trout. Uh, the Minnesota NR is actually doing um, some cool work. You can go to the next side. On, on brook trout. So these are both coasters from the North Shore. The one on the left was caught um, in the, and the one on the right was caught in the fall. Um, coasters do spawn in the fall, unlike steelhead, uh, but they will go in the rivers in the spring to eat eggs that the steelhead are dropping. So it's just kind of easy, easy food for them. And the fish on the right, you might've seen there was a little pink uh, floy tag yeah. Um, so the Minnesota DNR is doing a bunch of cool stuff. They, they've done a bunch of research with steelhead and the loopers or the cam loops. And now they're kind of focusing a little more on brook trout. Um, kind of one of the main questions that they're wondering about is, is a coaster brook trout genetically different than a native brook trout? And if a native brook trout flushes down below a, a coaster brook trout, or are they a different species altogether? Um, so they are doing some electroshocking and some angler, um, uh, volunteer angler. So you can go catch the uh, coaster brook trout. This one, so we already took a fin clip off of this back left um, fin, and then we send it in, and then they can do research to to see, um, yeah, a little bit more about it and the genetics. Um, so on that next slide, you can, if you do a lot of fishing on the North Shore, um, you can contact Nick Peterson. He's the DNR specialist up at the French River. Uh, so they do a lot of electrofishing. 
they can get a lot of fish, but there's a lot of brook trout that sit in deep pools that they just can't get to. So they want anglers to go out, catch them, send them information. Um, yeah, so anyone know what these fish are? It's a little tough. The pictures are a little small, but. Yeah, yeah, so those are coho salmon. Um, they're not as common as steelhead and brown trout. Uh, these were both caught on the bull, um, but you can catch coho salmon on the North Shore and on the South Shore of Lake Superior. Uh, and then these guys, yeah, yeah, kings or chinooks. Um, these were all taken out of the Brule River. Um, there used to be a pretty good fishery for kings on the North Shore, and then uh, they stop stocking them, and it's just not really, you might catch uh, like one or two on the North Shore, um, but there's generally a run of like three to 500 kings on the Brule River. Um, and then anyone know what those? Yeah, pink salmon. So on the North Shore um, is kind of the main pink salmon opportunity. Uh, September, uh, into October. I usually say the first big rain in September, um, but the last couple of years it's been October. Like the first or second week in October is pretty prime um, pink salmon fishing. And it's typically like in Alaska, it's an every other year run, but I don't know on Lake Superior if it's the fish just go anyways, or if there's like two different age classes that separated, but you can catch pinks pretty much every year. And it's a real fun thing to do. Um, if you're just kind of easing into steelhead, this is a perfect fish that if people are I'm just getting into fly fish and I want to catch steelhead, you use a lot of the same tactics as you do for steelhead. Um, there's more of them. They can be uh, tricky to catch because you can often see them and they don't always eat. So you can be fishing for them and it's gets a little frustrating at times, um, but you can catch egg patterns, nymphs, um, and my favorite streamers, just throw a typical size eight uh, woolly bugger in front of them and just strip it away and they'll be sitting there and then one will just tip after it. And so, yeah, they're a cool fish. Uh, this one, does anyone know that fish? Yeah, uh, splake. Yep. Yeah. So this is, it's a hybrid fish and you can see um, from my left thumb that it doesn't have an adipose fin. Um, so that typically means that any fish that doesn't have that is a stocked fish. And Minnesota doesn't stock splake. So this fish was actually caught on the North shore in the fall, but it was stocked by the Wisconsin DNR um, at some point. So it was kind of a cool, cool fish to catch. That was, that uh, coaster picture a couple slides ago was actually caught in the same pool like five minutes before this fish. How big do you get? Um, they'll get like 15, 16 kind of on average. This year was a bigger size and less yeah. numbers. Last year was more numbers and less size. Yeah. Uh, this fish, anyone? Yeah, so this, this is a tiger trout. Uh, this was caught by my buddy in the Brule River, um, and I'm impressed that you guys do because we did not know. We caught this fish, took a picture, like maybe a splake. It was just weird. Um, put it back um, and then contacted Nick with the DNR, and he's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a tiger trout. But that was, that was a cool fish. Um, so this may be a little bit of a trick. Does anyone know this one? Yeah. I heard cam loops. So this is easily uh mistakable for steelhead does anyone know why it's not a steelhead yeah so it's the same thing with the um stocked fish before so that splake had a clipped adipose and you can see here um typically the steel well trout have an adipose fin um and that was clipped um i'll cover a little bit about camloops now if you guys have it sounds like you know a little bit about them. Um, the Kamloops, 
is kind of a sad story. Now, they were one of my favorite fish to catch. Um, you can't really catch them anymore. That was, it was stocked in the, let's see, 1970s. And, and it had a good run um, until the DNR found out that they were hybridizing with the steelhead, um, which typically wouldn't be a huge problem. But when a steelhead and a steelhead have, have their eggs, it's like, I don't know, 15% of those eggs uh, survive and turn into more steelhead. When a looper or a cam loop and a steelhead spawn, it's like 4% of the eggs survive. So they're taking the same amount of river spawning real estate and just creating less fish. Um, and it was just an expensive, um, the French river where they um, had these loopers uh, needed millions of dollars of restoration. So they're like, well, we could spend millions of dollars and it's really just hurting the fishery or we could just scrap it. Um, so they stopped, I think it was seven years ago. Um, so the last, this was two or three years ago when it was kind of the last of the loopers, but that was a 29, 30 inch looper caught out of the safe harbor on like a size 18 little fly. So they were a cool, accessible fish to catch. Um, but unfortunately, it is uh, it is no more. So they're not stocking uh, uh, cam loops. They are um, instead taking steelhead that go up into the French River, which the cam loops used to. They're taking the eggs and milk, and then they're stocking uh, genetically similar steelhead. And then, so the idea of that is that when those stocked fish spawn with the wild steelhead, the eggs will still reproduce or turn into steelhead and we'll have a better fishery. Um, but it's the very beginning. They started doing that and then it was COVID. So they weren't catching the fish and then the hatchery shut down. And so it's, there's kind of gaps in the data and gaps in the hatchery. Um, so we'll see what the North Shore um, turns out to be. Uh, so I won't bore you a bunch on just kind of this nitty gritty stuff. Uh, basic steelheads, uh, life cycle though, um, steelheads spawn in the spring. Um, so on the North shore, it's spring only. You might get a couple steelhead that run up into the fall that you can catch. Um, but it's pretty much condition based. The fish come up, spawn by summer. Um, those eggs hatch into alvin, which is just like the, the little minnows with the egg sacs, sacs attached, um, and then eventually fry. And then they're par when they're two to six inches. Uh, smolt is your typical like eight to 10 um, inch fish. And then once they're about 12 inches and so they head out to the lake, they'll stay in the lake for roughly two years. They might come back as skipjacks when they are um, kind of that 12 to 19 inch range. But a lot of times those skipjacks will come back into the rivers. And I don't think they're, uh, some people call them sneakers. So they'll try to sneak in when a, a male and a female steelhead are spawning. Uh, skipjack can kind of catch them behind them. They'll sneak in, try to get with the, the female steelhead, or they're just eating the eggs. And then an adult steelhead is typically five years old, and they will live until they're six, seven, eight, maybe nine, ten. I'm sure there's some outliers, but your typical big steelheads, like five to eight years. Let's see. Um, so yeah, North Shore, there isn't a season, but it's uh, very condition-based. The last two springs especially Duluth well last year we had record breaking snowfall um it was a tough year usually fishing is good in uh beginning of March and April April tough so it was good fishing kind of the end of April into May this year um but you just kind of need all the ice to blow out so the fish can get into the rivers um and so spring is still Primary steelhead in the spring, April into early May is kind of your main steelhead um, time. And then 
Coaster brook trout is kind of a, a bycatch in the spring. Um, and then the North Shore in the fall, pink salmon and your coaster brook trout are both spawning. Um, and then on the South Shore, which there's a lot of rules, uh, rivers on the South Shore, the Brule's really the best one. I mean, it's not really like I don't go to this secret river. Uh, the Brule will take more fish than the entire North Shore combined. Um, that's just, there's better habitat. The It's a spring-fed river. Um, it never drops below a specific 115 CFS. So the fish are going to go in regardless if they're there. As um, But the North Shore can be tricky if there's not enough rain, too much rain. It makes it pretty tricky for them. Um, kind of the biggest thing with uh, the South Shore is and brule specifically. So steelhead spawn in the spring, but on the North Shore, they go up in the rivers, they spawn, and they leave. They may even go up, and then the river's too high, so they leave, and then they come in, and the water's too warm, so they leave, and then they come back. So they'll bounce in and out. They might even go to different rivers. Um, so there's been times where using that genetics um, study that Nick is doing at the DNR, that someone's caught fish, and then someone else has caught that fish the next day, 30 miles away in a different river. So the steelhead will typically bounce around on the North Shore, but they don't uh, really go back and forth. So you catch a steelhead in the Brule, and then that steelhead's going to go up the North Shore the next year. They kind of stick to their um, north or south sides. Um, but the biggest difference on the South Shore is the steelhead, the majority of them go in the river in the fall. Um, and winter over, but then they don't spawn until the spring and then out to the lake. So they spend most of their life in the river. So where to fish? Um, there are a ton of rivers on the North Shore. So North Shore fishing is you're just kind of driving up 61 and just kind of going from river to river. Um, there's less fishable water. Um, Let's see, I think you can go to the next slide too. Um, so I, are you guys familiar with barriers? If I said like a fish barrier. So a barrier is just, for the most part on the North Shore, a waterfall. And that's the separation between migratory fish and your native fish. So on the North Shore, our native fish are just brook trout um, and some creek chubs, but we don't have much for browns or other. So all of this... Let's see. So this is like Kadunts. So all this blue um, is brook trout habitat. And then all the red lines is um, your migratory water. So there would be either like a waterfall at all of these spots. Um, not all of the rivers have a barrier. So the Knife River on the North Shore is the biggest um, watershed without a barrier. So it takes the most amount of steelhead. Um, but some of the spots, there's the Fall River um, just um, south of Grand Marais. There's a waterfall almost on the lake and little pools and the steelhead will spawn almost. I mean, they go like 20 feet and they spawn there. Um, so if you're going up the shore and just being like, oh, I'm going to go steelhead fishing. If you drive up this road and then you're trying to catch steelhead, they're just not going to be there. So you have to find out where the barriers are. Um, typically just working your way from the mouth is, is the easiest way to do that. Um, so then the Brule River, like I said, the Brule takes more fish than the North Shore combined. Um, instead of driving up the highway and going from one river to another, you typically drive up and down. There's about 20 different parking spots and then you can walk in and, and fish um, different areas of the Brule. Um, one thing to note, oh, I was going to ask at the beginning, I'm getting ahead of myself. How many of you have gone steelhead fishing? Cool. Almost everyone. How many of you have landed a steelhead? Slightly less. So that's exactly how it works. <laughs> um, it, they are a hard fish to catch. Um, it took me, uh, I shouldn't even tell you guys, I think seven, I should ask my wife, I think it was seven times that I went out 
Um, before I really knew what I was doing, I didn't talk to anyone. Um, and I went to the brule and came back and said, did you catch any fish? Said, nope. And she's like, all right, are you going to be done? I'm like, nope, I'm going tomorrow. So I went seven times and I eventually caught a steelhead. And now slippery slope. I'm up here talking to you guys. So, <laughs> so it's a good thing I caught that one. Um, but just real quick. So the Brule River, if you have fished, have you guys fished the Brule River before? A lot of you, okay. Um, just recently, I'll just kind of cover quick. Um, there's been some land closures on the Brule that kind of popped up during COVID when everyone was flocking to the Brule. And there was a couple people that trespassed and started fires and just did some, some bad stuff. And it just kind of went from there. So if you haven't gone recently and you show back up again, uh, just kind of be aware that you might walk and go like, I'm going to this spot and you might not be able to go there anymore. Um, it's not, I don't know, I should probably post it on like my website or something. Um, but just, just to be aware of where you can and cannot go. Um, so other than just like spring and fall, it gets a little, uh, more nitty gritty on when to fish, uh, based on conditions, um, and conditions for migratory fish. Uh, it's mainly due to high water. Um, but high water really brings sediment and makes, um, the waters, uh, the clarity hard to fish. Um, so this is a graph, um, most, let's see, I think there's five rivers on the North shore that are kind of spread out, um, that have graphs and you can, I don't think I told you, I have a website. You can go to my website. Um, and I have a, a link there that you can just click and it'll say, it'll take you to the the baptism river flow. And then you can see like what it is and if it's fishable or not. Um, I would say, uh, so CFS, um, cubic feet per second is kind of the standard river flow, um, rates. Um, 300 is kind of a general, that's getting pretty high. Um, it can be fishable, but if it, just jumps up, it's going to be too dirty. So even if it's too high, it's probably the clarity is not going to be good enough. So if I'm looking at this graph right here, um, I would have been fishing all of these days. And then <laughs> my wife laughs. Um, and then it bumps up. Um, this is all probably get a little dirty this day and then a little dirty and then I wouldn't fish it until probably a couple of days after April 13th, just because it's high, it's dirty. Um, so you just have to watch the flow. Um, let's see. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, yeah, so that kind of brings me to clarity and water temperature. Um, water temperature is, it's kind of important. Um, it's not like the most important if I show up to the river and it's like, ah, it's kind of cold. I'm not going to go home. So you still, you should go fishing. Um, 32 degrees. I've caught fish through literally the ice, like gone on the North shore. The, the river is all iced up, walked around a pool and just like broke the ice off and caught steelhead underneath the ice. So if there is water for them to go, they'll go in the rivers. Um, even if it's slushy. So don't be too discouraged by cold water, um, but they can be a little lethargic so they don't go crazy jumping, fighting. Um, 40 degrees is kind of the magic temperature for spawning. So once the water starts creeping up, then they're getting a little more active. 55, um, real good fishing. If you do like the two-hander thing, um, that's a better time to fish because they get a little more active. They'll chase down your fly. Um, and then 70 degrees is, is not good. Just like any trout, um, they don't want to be there. These fish have the opportunity to leave, unlike native trout. So once the, the river bumps up in temp, they're gone. So if the, you fish the North Shore, uh, the temp's like 65, 70, they might not be there. Um, and then just water clarity. Uh, I kind of like one foot of clarity is good. Once it gets like two or three feet, they can get spooky. When it's less than that, you got to be like hitting them in the nose. 
Tamam. All right. Um, the next couple slides. It's a. I'll kind of go through these quick. Um, it's a little bit of nerdy data stuff, but it's good to know. So this is the Knife River. Uh, they put the trap on the Knife River, like 1980s, something like that. Um, and you can kind of see. So the dark number is the steelhead. The light number is the clipped, uh, the cam loop trout. And then some of the clipped fish are the new um, stock, the clipped steelhead that they've been uh, replacing the loopers with. But you can kind of see just a general idea that it's not bad fishing, but it's not as good as it was eight, 10 years ago. Um, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Yeah, it is weird. Why? So that there was the 2012 flood that definitely didn't help the fishing. Um, it might have just been the fish were just hanging out in the lake an extra couple of years and just getting bigger and more. But um, let's see. Yeah. So here uh, is kind of catch rate on the North Shore. Um, and again, I don't really know what happened in 2006 that made it um, a little bit easier to catch steelhead and a little bit harder to catch loopers. Um, but the clipped, let's see, the clipped fish is the blue bars. Um, the unclipped wild steelhead are the gray. Um, the dotted black line is the catch rate for uh, loopers. And then these little circles are the steelhead. So I don't know. All in all, this generally shows, so like this 0.15 designate, designates that it takes about like six or seven hours to catch one fish. Um, so this bottom one is like 0 0.0002. So you have to spend, I don't know, like 400 hours to catch a clipped fish <laughs> now. So it can be tough. Um, so this, so we've switched again. So that was North Shore data. This is the South Shore data. Um, so there is kind of, let's see, the last 30 years of data for brown trout, coho salmon, and steelhead. Um, and it's been fairly consistent with a few ups and downs. Um, it has been a little harder the last two years, I'd say, for even North Shore and um, Brule River. So if you've been fishing it recently um, and had a harder time, you're not alone. Um, it has been a harder um, fishery. There's just been few fewer fish than there was uh, like five, six years ago. Um, yeah, so timing. In the fall um brown trout come first in the fall starting in like even end of july they start coming into the river um and then your steelhead and coho kind of come in usually peaking around october um and then november 15th is when the season closes um so this was let's see last year in the fall 3000 brown trout um 339 kings uh, uh 2000 coho 5000 um steelhead zero brook trout sometimes that number is three or one or four um pink salmon was 17 sometimes that's like nine or um i've seen pink salmon in the brule but there's not many of them and then splake um yeah so that last graph if you just took the steelhead in the fall um, that would be this section of the graph. And then that section is the spring. So I said like in the fall, most of the steelhead go into the rivers. And then in the spring, more had more steelhead come in and then they all spawn in the spring and then leave. Um, and that's same. Just to get that, they're staying in the river all winter. Yes. Okay. Yep. So the season's closed, but they're staying in the river. Yep, yep. They're not going out and then 
coming back or spawning. Yep, they're coming in the rivers, wintering over, um, and then they'll they'll spawn in the spring. Let's see, um, so this is the the lamprey barrier diagram that was built um, on the Brule in '84 um, to keep keep the lamprey out. Um, and you might wonder, like, how do they know that there was what seventeen pinks and what nine splake and stuff? Um, so somewhere in that little fishway passage, you can go to the next slide. There's a camera, and some lucky Wisconsin DNR employee, uh, probably right, well, not right now, but tomorrow is going to be sitting in a dark room watching a screen that's video going. Um, all the fish and saying, okay, 19 inch female steelhead, 24 inch male brown trout, and they will uh, measure sex um, and ID these, a total of like 10,000 fish that go into the drool every year. So that's pretty cool that they do that for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they stick around very long doing that job. Um, so this data that I pulled, they don't graph this out, but they kind of give you a general, like this many fish were caught in this size range. Um, so this is over the last like seven years. Uh, the blue is the skipjack. So kind of that uh, three-year-old mid-teens fish. The red is your average steelhead, 20 to 22 inches. And then the yellow is 26 inches or bigger. Um, and as you can see, especially in the last like three, four years, um, there was a lot of 22, 23 inch steelhead. Um, and the last year, and I'm expecting this year to be very similar to the last year, um, that there wasn't a ton of steelhead, but the ones that you caught were, were pretty big. So um, I used to tell, yeah, people that I'd gotten before, if you caught a fish over 26 inches last year, that was 9% of the fish that went in the river. So it was a pretty big deal if you caught one over 26. This year, it's 30% of the fish are above 26 inches. So it's more common to catch bigger fish. So these are three fish that were all caught in the last uh, two years. Uh, the one on the left, that's your typical smolt. Um, so it's not a, well, it is a smaller steelhead, but it's still a steelhead. Um, it hasn't gone out to the lake yet, but it will um, probably within a year of that picture. Um, this one's kind of in between that big skipjack uh, steelhead, um, like a, maybe 2021. 20, um, and then the steelhead on the right was just caught uh, maybe a month ago by one of my Buddies, that was a 30 inch steelhead on the drool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can. Yeah, we'll put the video on. Okay. I got a couple of little videos of this. Um... So eventually we'll show. So this is a guy that I guided last year, caught a really nice steelhead um, and just got a little clip of him um, biting this fish. We got, we got, yep. <laughs> All right, cool. Bob yeah. Mark's like, what's going on? Hold on. Yeah. We're going to get the video up. Oh. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's not mortality. Those aren't numbers um, of the fish going in and then coming out. That's all fish going in. So there's like, yes. Yep. So it'll be like 4,000 fish come in. They winter over. They're doing fine in the river. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, or if they do, they don't count them. Going, yeah, I think they just go right over the weir. Yeah, good question. All right, we can do that at the end. I got a couple other videos too. Yeah. 
sorry about that. No, that's okay. Now it's on there. Okay, we're lagging. It was there. There we go. Oh, what's that? Oh, I think, I think they're trying to get it, the video running. Any other questions while we're yeah. Oh uh, yeah, yes, what happened to all the smelt that used to be up there? Um I'm not sure what exactly happened to all the smelt. Um that was the big smelt specific runs were a little before my time, but now it's used to be able to go up into the North Shore rivers and just scoop smelt out with a net and now it's you kind of need big nets and there's a few less um the w minnesota dnr is doing a predator prey um analysis so there are less smelt but there are more white fish and there's more prey um so the smelt have been going downhill i don't really know why um but the other food availability is doing pretty well um, so lake trout are doing real well in Lake Superior right now. And then the coho are doing, uh, good too. So they're, I don't know if many of you heard, um, but yeah, perfect. Um, the coho, like a, if you went out trolling on the big lake or caught a coho in the river, they're like 15, 16, 17, like maybe upper teens inches. Um, I think Minnesota broke the coho record. Um, three different times, like in one weekend or something this last summer. So there's some uh, big coho this year. And I think that's due to some of like the prey availability, more like white fish, um, stuff like that. Okay, cool. Going to go into a little bit of uh, tips. So going fishing, you got all your stuff, you know where you're going, you get to the spot, you get to the river. Uh, what do you do first? Um, if it's me, I just like, I get really excited and I, I jump in the water and I fish the, see how far I can cast. But what you should do is fish the inside seam first um, before you do anything. Um, steelhead aren't crazy spooky, so it's not quite like driftless where you have to sneak up onto them, cast like lightly upstream. You can get away with more, but a lot of times the steelhead will sit on the inside soft water um, and if you step right where they're sitting, you're not going to catch them. So always fish the inside seam first. Um, and then what I like for is walking speed water. Um, so the steelhead sit in roughly like two, three mile an hour per hour water is kind of comfortable for them. Um, so that's something to look for. But once you find that, don't get too like, all right, there's the walking speed water and get a cast out there you want to hit that inside seam first um. <laughs> here you can go one one more slide or maybe back to two or back one back to yeah yeah so line management um it's a real big de deal uh when you're steelhead fishing um, so for trout, you let enough out just to get just with steelhead. You want to get as long of a drag-free drift as possible. And to get the longest drift you can, you need more line out. Um, and things just get a little tricky because you're going to cast a bunch of line out and then that line's going to come into you. And if your indicator goes down and you still have a bunch of line out, you're not going to be able to set the hook. So it's a lot of line management. You're constantly moving, casting the line, stripping the line in. And then once it, your indicator gets in front of you, feeding line out, trying to get your indicator to 
go past you without moving um, and just always being ready to set the hook. Um, and mending is kind of how you, the other way to do that. So mending, um, you guys are familiar with mending. It's a pretty, it's, it's super important when you're steelhead fishing um, to mend. Um, and it's pretty much all nymphing. Uh, there's a lot of different types. I'll go over some techniques later. Most of what I do for steelhead and other migratory fish is nymphing. Um, so um, indicator, some split shot, flies, uh, casting out and then mending your line to make sure those flies get a nice drag free drift. Um, let's see. So the fish are going to be pretty much on the bottom. Some of the spots that we'll fish, they'll be in one feet. Of, the fish can be in like a foot of water. They can be up like eight feet deep pools um, and typically be on the bottom. So you always want to fish as deep as you can. Um, and to do that, you need to just adjust your rig. So moving your indicator, adding weight, um, mending better uh, helps get your flies deeper. So if you have any drag in the system, it's just going to pull your flies up and then they're just going to slowly sink back down. So those are kind of your three things that I like to work on to make sure every all my flies are down at the bottom where the fish are. Um, and then just try to picture where it's hard if you haven't done it a lot to picture where the fish is, um, but just pick a spot and then don't mend right in that spot every time. So try to mend your line so your indicator moves through slowly. And then once, if you don't catch a fish there for a while, then picture huh, maybe the fish is back here. So cat up, do your mends um, ahead of there. Um, and then so cast slow. This is one thing that I've learned a lot when I guide that you're using a heavier rod, heavier line, uh, more flies, and tends to just try to go as hard as they can. But when you have all that extra gear, you need to slow everything down. So it's a little counterintuitive, uh, but steelhead fishing with a nymph set up, just make, every, make sure everything's real nice and slow. Um, until when the indicator goes down, then you gotta be quick with the hooks. Um, maybe at the end, I got one little video of letting the fish run. So it's very important. Um, oftentimes when you're steelhead fishing, you have a lot of line out, but the goal is to fight the fish on the reel. Like you're, if you're trout fishing in the driftless, a lot of times you just catch them, strip them in. With steelhead, you wanna let the drag do the work. So you'll fight them on the line. At some point, the fish might settle down to the point where you can kind of reel a little bit of line up and you want to get them on the drag. So it's one less thing to think about. And then if they run, let them run. Don't try to horse them in and get them in the net because that's how they break off. And that's kind of the main way that you lose steelhead. Um, and it's, it's a tough thing. You spend like eight hours in a day, you might hook one steelhead uh, and you have like a 50% chance of landing that fish, if not less than that. So it's, you want to make sure everything is are there's a lot of different ways to fish. i mean you can fish with a spinning rod you can fish with a fly rod you can fish uh with fly line or with mono um you can use a two-handed rod there's a lot of different ways to do this uh the two ways that i like to do it is nymphing uh with fly line and an indicator or swinging flies with a two-handed rod um so that's what i'm going to go over if you guys have questions about uh tight lining or your own, uh, I don't know much about your own nymphing, but you can ask questions at the end if there's something that I don't cover, but I'll mainly cover uh, nymphing and swinging. Um, so this is typical setup for pretty much all the migratory fishing that I do, um, a 10 foot seven weight. Like you can get, if you have a nine foot eight weight rod that, for like doing some bass and pike stuff, that works great. If you're gonna be like dedicated steelhead, 
get a 10 foot seven weight. That's like the rod. Um, the reel just pair it up to the rod. Doesn't have to be, it should be nice enough because um, you don't want to have uh, a reel that doesn't have a smooth drag. So you want a nice enough reel. Um, the rod doesn't have to be anything fancy, but it, a 10 foot helps uh, cast and mend. Um, and a seven weight's just a good uh, balance for fighting fish. It's not too much that you can use light tippet, but it's not too light that you can actually uh, move the fish around if you need to. Let's see, um, so leader, this is, I've used a lot of different, I've built my own leaders. Um, I've used a bunch of different styles. This is kind of what I narrowed it down to. So I use a, a seven and a half foot zero X nylon leader. That's just what I do for every, every um, steelhead fishing, North shore, South shore. That's kind of what I start with. Um, white and catch one on blue or something crazy um so sometimes it helps to have a little diversity of color of eggs you can do next slide right um and then the next is bugs um and it's just kind of a, a generic um so turnarsis your giant stone fly um very prolific on the brule river and on the uh, a little bit on the north shore um the north shore doesn't have a lot of life <laughs> to it so the steelhead go in uh, they can spawn but there's just not um much for macro invertebrates for them to eat um but on the the brule river there's a lot of bugs there's a lot of caddis uh giant stone flies then acronuria uh your golden stone fly are kind of these are the main two that i um base most of my fly patterns off of um so like top left Superior X legs, very standard uh, fly, uh, past rubber legs, Kaufman stone, um, and then Prince nymph, 
uh, pheasant tail. I mean, you, it's a lot of standard stuff. I, I think if it looks buggy, it'll catch a fish. You don't have to be too finicky over um, colors and sizes. I've caught steelhead on some like almost embarrassing stuff that I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just going to put some of this stuff on here and it, and it catches a steelhead and it's cool, but then it's frustrating because it's like, well, why did it eat that? It shouldn't have eaten that. Um, but that stuff will work. The one thing you do want to uh, keep in mind though, uh, so uh, size of hooks. This is like 12s, 10s, uh, stoneflies. I use sixes, eights, sometimes fours. Uh, just make sure the gauge of the hook is uh, heavy enough. So you don't want to take your driftless box and use like a 14 light wire hook because it'll bend out on a steel head pretty quick. Even those those flies will work. <laughs> it's just hard to land them. Yeah, so this is just, a, um, that's the giant stone fly uh, from the Brule. This is, it's a hairy ass stone that John uh, Fennell ties at the Great Lakes Fly Shop up in Duluth. Uh, or this, this is one I tied, but it's a variation off of his pattern. Um, and that's uh, a, one of the, that might've been one of the first steelhead that I ever caught that it, it swallowed that one pretty good. Yeah, so this is just a little diagram of um, the rigging. So the first um, kind of half is the leader. And that's the seven and a half foot zero X nylon tapered. Um, I like to use micro swivels instead of a line to line knot. So I'll use a blood knot if I have to, but I prefer a micro swivel even above a, um, a tippet ring. Um, I like the swivel just to keep it from um, spinning and turning and tangling and stuff. Yeah, good question. I I typically want my best knots. So this whole thing is tapered, like tapered leader, 0x, um, 2x, 3x, or one. So everything gets lighter and lighter. I also want my knots stronger to lighter. So this knot to my top one, I typically tie like a Palomar because it's um, a doubled over. It's kind of more popular in bass fishing than um, trout fishing. Um, or the what the rappel knot when you go through twice. I just want something that's extra strong. So if I do break off, snag off, I'm not losing everything. I'm hopefully just losing the bottom fly. If I'm gonna lose both, hopefully it breaks off of the second fly and not I lose everything. Swivel. It's just more time on the water. So yeah. Good class. And then from down from that, I usually use clinch knot, improve clinch. Um I will, yeah, you don't have to, you can use one knot. If you want to just do clinch knots, the whole thing, perfect. Um, I typically do a, ah, it's dumb. I do Palomar knot, clinch knot, uh, loop knot to the top of my top fly. And then I clinch knot off the eye of the hook of the top fly. And then typically we'll tie a loop knot or a clinch knot to the bottom fly. Um, just because that's the way I do it. <laughs> There's a couple of reasons. Um, I like tying eye to eye on the top um, just because if, so I used to tie to the bend of the hook on off the top fly and you still can, that works just fine. Um, and this is Brule River specific because you can use more than one fly but I use a lot of barbless flies too, and I'm not confident tying off on a bend of a hook on a barbless fly. Um, so I do eye to eye. And then if a steelhead does eat the top fly and you have the bottom fly dangling around, if your bottom fly catches in the fish or snags in the rock, if you're tied off the bend of the hook, it's just gonna pull the hook out of its mouth. But if you're tied eye to eye, Hopefully it just breaks the bottom fly off and you can still land the fish. I have not in person been like, oh man, good thing I tied to the eye because otherwise I would have lost that fish. But mentally, it's something that I like to do. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'm gonna go, I got one slide for North Shore, uh, one slide for South Shore. So North Shore, if you haven't um, fished the North Shore before, it's one fly only. Um, and that's from, it's like 100 feet from the shore mouth up to the barrier. Um, and the North Shore is mostly eggs. Um, it's, you fish the North Shore in the spring for the first month until the water hits like 55 degrees, it's just eggs. You can just rotate through one fly, different color eggs. Um, that's gonna be your, your best bet. Um, kind of the changes that I'll do is either use an indicator or not. So there's some instances, um, probably the majority of fishermen on the North Shore fish a tight line rig, which is a fly rod, fly reel, loaded up with just mono really heavy weights, um, like a slinky rig, which is weights in a little paracord sleeve, and you're just flicking it up and bouncing it across the rocks. Um, I started fishing like that. I snagged a couple steelhead doing that, and I just didn't really like it. So if you like tight line fishing, that's fine. I just prefer to do uh, use a, a fly line, um, but I can still take the, the indicator off and add weight and fish a similar method. Um, so if you get to a real deep hole where it's like a little waterfall and you, the fish are gonna be sitting right here, I'll add a bunch of weight, take the indicator off and just kind of flick it and feel kind of like you're on thing or tight lining with a little less feel that you'd get on a dedicated rod. But that's pretty simple North Shore stuff. Um, and then the Brule, this doesn't have to be this complicated, but there's three different ideas that I think of when I get to a spot on the brule. Um, so there's big deep pools, there's riffles, um, and there's stuff in between. Um, and I will, I have a preferred indicator or float or bobber um, for each scenario. Most of the time I'm just running that airlock. Um, but this first one, um, in faster water, I like all my weight in my split shot and then fairly weightless flies. So they're just drifting in the current. Um, the second one, uh, like having a tungsten jigged, uh, like a prince nymph or pheasant tail um, with a weightless dropper um, and like spacing out my split shot is kind of, I don't know, between, I probably use this one the most with this indicator. And then the third way, if it's a really deep hole, um, this is more of like a center pin style rig from the float or indicator down. So I space the split shot out um, and I add two heavy flies and then I wanna just flick it out. And then I want that bottom fly to just be ticking on the bottom. And the benefit of those floats is that you can tell what your flies are doing. So if I just threw this indicator out, I can tell if the indicator stops or moves, but if you throw one of these thills or the blackbird float out, it'll land in the water and you can tell that it's sinking, 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 and then it'll kind of settle in and you can tell your flies are at the bottom. And then you want that indicator just ticking, if not leaning forward. Um, and it's just a good way to kind of dial in the depth. Um, so just different, different cool stuff you can buy. You know, you don't really need it, but cool. Um, does anyone uh, two-handed swing spay cast here? Got a couple. Cool. <laughs> well, yeah, this is uh, kind of my new favorite way to fish um, for steelhead. Um, I talked about before how it takes a really long time to catch a steelhead. That's generally nymphing. It takes like eight some hours. Once you start adding in uh, the two-handed rod, it gets a lot harder. Um, but it's one of those things you spend a lot of time doing this. But I would say, Rick, would you say it's more fun? Yeah, I, I, honestly, I really just like looking at the drawer or something. Else. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, you can relax and you relax for a while until something just like, oh, yeah. And then the fish just like rips the rod out of your hand. So you always got to be on edge, but it's, yeah, it's one of the, the cooler things.
things since not a lot does anyone have like interest in starting to do all right a couple i'm gonna i got like two or three slides on just setup so i'll just go through quick and then we can do questions um so that is going to be even more complicated if you're never going to do this but um <laughs> um probably six or seven weight uh so they make switch rods which is probably a better route to take. So a single-handed fly rod, like a nine foot, 10 foot single-handed rod is your standard. Uh, spay fishing, you can get a two-handed rod. They're usually like 12, they go up um, to like 15, 16 feet. Um, and then there's switch rods that are in the middle. They have two handles. They're not as moderate action as a true spay rod. So you can still single hand um, and I know a lot of people will even use a switch rod, like an 11 foot switch rod to indicator nymph with. And it's a really good tool on the brule to get really long casts at big holes. Um, and that's a really good setup um, to get into swinging with a switch rod. Um, let's see. Yeah. So it's a little different. Use laser line, uh, running line. I like uh, the OPST's commando head. Um, and just the general rule of spay casting is you have your entire weight of your fly line condensed into a short chunk. And then instead of casting that uh, delicately and accurately, you're just bombing the entire weight of the fly line out and then using your running line uh, to let it shoot. So you can hit really long distances, hit water that other people can't hit. Um, and it's it's a cool way to do it. Um, and then it's versatile because you can use different sink tips um, and get to different depths diff and use different flies that are different weights. Um, yeah, I use the same swivel and then typically 12 pound mono in like a four foot um, chunk for my leader. Yeah, so. I should have just went right to this. I also have an article on my website on all this gear. So if you are interested, um, that's a good resource to kind of get um, an idea of the rod, the line, because it is. it took me a long time to figure out um, all the moving parts on swinging as compared to nymphing. So. Yeah, and I think that's a couple of videos, but I don't know. Yeah. If we can get some videos to play, cool. But otherwise, I think that's all I got. All right. Well, thank you, Jason. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, what we're going to do now is ask the Zoom folks to uh, put some questions in the chat, and I will read them to Jason. And once we get the, uh, done with those, uh, we can have the, the live audience uh, pitch in with their questions. And Jason, when the live audience does start asking questions, it would be good if you could repeat the question before you answer it. Yeah. So right now we have just one question from our Zoomers. It's from Mike Grangs. And he wants to know how important the time of day is for fishing. Yeah, that is a really, a really good question. So time of day... Um, it is pretty similar to your typical fishing where like mornings and evenings are better than midday. Um, other than on really cold days, um, North Shore and South Shore, I've had a lot of days on the South Shore, you get to the water, it's freezing. And then once the sun hits the river, it warms the, the water up just like a degree or two and the fish just turn on. Um, so just your general fishing, if it's not totally snowy, cold out, uh, morning and evening, but it's not a, like go home for lunch. Cause they're not going to bite midday kind of deal. <laughs> okay, great. The next question is very interesting one. It's from, uh, Cyrus Knudsen and he's wondering for swinging, if it might be better to measure, um, instead of fish per hour, measure fish per week. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> I have no comment. That's true. That would be a better. <laughs> Let the record reflect that Jason has no comment. Yeah. 
the, the next question is from Carl Con Connors, and he was he missed what you said about the size of the nymphs that you use. Can you cover that once more? Yeah, so I like to use, um, I personally use 12s as kind of a standard uh, nymph, like Prince Nymph. Uh, it's nothing crazy. There's a couple patterns that, as a fly tire, I like to uh, mix it up and have my own little variations and colors and stuff. Um, but otherwise, 12s to go to, I've got a lot of them on 14s. Um, 16, it's hard to find gauge wire that's going to hold a steelhead. Um, but I have a lot of buddies that use uh, 10s and 8 uh, nymphs. And I think you can get pretty big, too, with stoneflies and 4s fours, fours through 12s is kind of a, a standard. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Tom Ellingson. And he's wondering if you have any uh, tips for proper, I guess, the cycle of playing the fish, properly landing it and handling it um, so that you can effectively release it. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really good. So most steelhead that you catch are going to take a while to get in. Uh, I would say the standard, at least this year, like on the Brule, um, you hook, you always want to keep a bend in the rod to keep the fish from coming off. But a lot of times there's not a lot you can do. You're just kind of at the will of the fish and when the fish is going to get tired enough for you to get it into the net. Um, it is good to tire it out, not too much, um, but enough that it's not going to be thrashed around hurting itself in the net. Um, so it, I would say on average, it takes like five minutes to land a steelhead um, and it often goes on multiple different runs. So you hook it. Uh, usually the standard thing, uh, you cast out your indicators drifting, it goes down you set the hook, the fish immediately will jump a couple feet in the air and then land. And then it'll go upstream, downstream or right to your feet. And the ones that come right to your feet are usually the smart ones because they just get all that slack and you're not able to, stay tight on them and then they come to your feet and then are gone um but they have a lot of uh ways to get off um they can go into wood they can run at your feet they can not stay in the spot that you're fishing and just go down river and just catch the current and just go i've had a couple actually my i'm just recovering from the last day of the season where i i had a client hook a steelhead that went down river and it went around three giant piles of brush and he couldn't get around it. So I ran around um, and fell on the rocks <laughs> and then the fish was going under a log and I just grabbed his line and like dove under and, and hooked the fish. But that was, uh, it was really cool. It was, you should have been there. It was awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> landed the fish. I was the hero. And, um, but yeah, so back to the, um, landing and <laughs> releasing safely um yeah it, it takes five -ish or so minutes you want to get the fish in the net um try to keep them in the water as long as you can um get the hooks out if you're going to take a picture i like to just hold it above the net drop it if you drop it back in the net don't bring them up on the bank um and really just get them back in the water as fast as you can is the best best thing to do Okay. Well, while we're on the topic of nets, Ben Rumi wants to know if you have recommendations or things to look for in a net, uh, such as dimensions, etc. He said he learned the hard way this fall. Yeah, that is a really good question. A lot of times I'll be fishing on the Brule and I'll see people with um, trout nets and it's going to do you more harm than good. Like if you, if you just have a trout net and you're going to go steelhead fishing, don't bring it because you're going to just get half the fish in and it's going to fall out um, and probably land where you don't want it to land. Um, so having a big net is good. I don't know. I was going to bring my net. Um, I don't know the exact dimension. So I have a custom net um, that was built from a guy in Duluth, uh, Damn Goods and Gear. Um a good guy, he builds custom stuff so he doesn't use um, jigs. So everything's one of a kind, um, fancy wood. Uh, I think his, you know, go to damngoodsandgear.com. 
Um, and he has, I think it's like a migratory fish net. Um, otherwise, uh, fish pond, I think their El Jefe is kind of the big one. I would recommend a big net, like probably tw 12 inches wide, uh, 20 inches um, long, something like that with the, the deeper basket, as deep as you can get it. Um, I prefer the ghost nylon nets. I think they're a little easier on the fish than the, the nylon. Um, they're a little heavier, but that's my go-to. Um, there was a guy, was it, was it dead drift nets? There was a guy in the cities that was building nets, but I don't think he is anymore. I don't think you can get his nets. Um, but yeah, I would check out Dan Goods and Gear or um, if you're going to get something just from a store, the like uh, fish pond El Jefe or maybe one size down is a good option. Fish pond has 250 bucks for it. Yeah, they are uh, expensive. No, and same with uh, the damn goods and gear net, but I think his nets are also like 250 and they're custom made. Um, so it's kind of, uh, you can get, I know at the Superior Fly Shop, um, you can get some nets for under 100 that are big enough to, to fit a steelhead in there. Okay, uh, Bill Brandt wants to know if sun hitting the water matters during normal water temperatures. Um, yeah, I I prefer to fish the shade. If I'm at a spot that's like kind of sunny, kind of shady, um, I prefer to fish the, the shady spot. Uh, doesn't mean that you're not going to catch a steelhead in the sunny, the sunny spot. The, the tough thing is there's a lot of rules and tips and stuff that like, this should be the thing. Like you should catch a steelhead in the morning, in the shade, 40 degrees, overcast, drizzly day, on a nip. Like there's rules that we've made up for the fish, but the fish often don't cooperate. Um, so it's crazy how many times it's, I've gone out for a day and been like, oh, we just, I ran through everything. And then at the end of the day, it's just like, I don't know, let's try this and it's like sunny spot shallow you think you can see the bottom throwing some weird gaudy thing and a steelhead eats it so even it, they throw me for a loop sometimes <laughs> okay christy maleka wants to know uh she says good tips on playing the fish when to set the hook uh yeah often so <laughs> uh, when you're indicator fishing uh, you throw out your your indicator flies. Um, it'll take a couple seconds for your flies to hit the bottom. It'll it takes a little bit of time to figure out what's bottom and what's a fish. Um, but in the meantime, if your indicator does anything weird at all, uh, set the hook. So often it it'll come down. Sometimes it's just it stops. It doesn't even go under. Um, and you should just set the hook um, and then recast if it's not a fish. So that's, it's pretty important to just, um, so one of the uh, kind of guiding um, phrases that you hear a lot is hook sets are free. So just let them, let them happen. <laughs> Indicator goes down, go for it. Okay. Uh, Tom Pharisee, uh, I think it's Tom, it says Kate Pharisee, but I'm guessing that's his spouse. Uh, does the Brule River get overcrowded with anglers? <laughs> yes, it does. Um, it, it does. The last couple of years, it got really busy, especially um, this year, there was a, a couple of days that were really busy and kind of in general, People are like, oh, I'm not going to go on a weekend. I'm going to go weekday. And weekdays have been almost busier than weekends just because everyone has the same idea. Um, but if you can get out, you can get out. And what I've found is even if the, the brule gets busy, um, finding some little pocket water is often, a lot of times the fish are sitting there and they're not sitting in the big holes and pools that everyone's fishing anyways. So I don't get discouraged if there's, too many people. I mean, obviously I would like to go fish the brule and, oh, there's no cars here, but I'm here in the Twin Cities telling 
all of you guys to come check out the Brule. And you should. It's a it's a great fishery. It gets busy um, as long as you guys are all coming to the river, respecting the landowners, respecting the water, respecting the fish, um, hooking a fish, playing it like the right way and getting it back into the water. Awesome. Like there shouldn't be any like don't come to the spot and I don't know. It's it's public. It's for everyone. Go fish it. Yeah. Excellent. Well right. said. Uh, I think this may be the final question uh, from Paul Connors. I fished the Brule for seven plus years, usually one or two days a year, and have caught one steelhead about 20 inches, many, many browns, and plenty of the tiny ones. What is the best water you are looking for specifically? Deeper holes? Um, uh, It's hard to say without knowing what you've been fishing um, in the past. It, I think you can fish... <laughs> Um, yeah, I think deeper holes are generally better. I mean, if the water's low, um, that's where they're going to be. If the water's high, a lot of times they're on the slack inside edges. They're just trying to get out of the current. So you have to adapt depending on the flow and the clarity. So it's not just to like go here. Um, that's where they'll be, but a good starting point is uh deeper slower water um i've caught more browns in deeper like deep almost stagnant water and steelhead like faster water so if you're after specifically steelhead um maybe you're fishing water that's too slow and i might uh kind of if it's a warmer day fish the the head of a run um like way up in the rocks and like a foot of water might be a good option Okay, well, that is the Zoom questions. Uh, I guess I'll turn it over to the in-person audience to see if there's any other questions. I just have a, a comment for all of you, especially Jason had that slide of how many hours it takes to land a fish. Do you think that's because his wife and his in-laws are here? <laughs> well, honey, it took me eight hours and I only hooked one fish. And we should all try that. <laughs> Do you have questions? Raise your hand, jump up. Yep, lean back. Yeah. 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 Um, so the question was, there's a lot of construction going on on the Stewart and the Silver Creek on the North Shore. Um, and how will that affect fishing this next spring? Um, if they're doing their construction the right way, it won't affect it at all. Um, and which they will be. The, you got to jump through a lot of hoops to do a lot of that construction. They do a lot of work on keeping sediment out of the water. Um, and they're not blocking it off in any way. Um, so I would say it should be better if not the same like it, it's not going to make it worse yeah so i'd still fish it if you were planning on it yeah other questions yep yeah when you uh, send me all uh copy of presentations you can push it out to us yeah i can do that thanks yeah this is also recorded right yes yes, yes, yes. yeah so this presentation be available on our youtube channel any other questions? Oh, we got one here, Jim. I do. Yes, uh, the Lester River uh, go. So, so the question was, do I ever fish the Lester River? Um, the Lester River goes through the town of Duluth on the North Shore. Um, the Lester is a great river. Uh, it's not my favorite because it's not very scenic and I don't really like going there and just having a bunch of people um, watching and just kind of milling around but it takes it probably one of the top I don't know five if not ten rivers on the north shore in fish numbers um, and size there's some big fish um, there they've also so when they 
stop stocking the Kamloops. They're stocking the uh, steelhead that they're taking from the French River. Uh, they're putting 120,000 um, fry from those stockings, half of them in the French and half of them in the Leicester. So potentially in the future, there should be a little bit better fishery on the South Shore, specifically the Leicester for catching clipped fish, if that's kind of a, a priority too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, so the question was, uh, uh, this guy went out uh, fishing for pink salmon on the North Shore, and what was it, you didn't fish any... Yeah, so he, he fished um, up the Knife French and Stewart Rivers on the, the lower shore of the North Shore. Um, and asking if that's um, where the pinks are, if they're any further up north. Uh, they're in just like the steelhead in any major tributary along the shore. Um, they're also in the Leicester. They're in um, the Sucker, the Knife, the Stewart. Um, there's a bunch up the shore too. Um, I like going further up the shore. I didn't show a slide this year. Um, there is kind of a difference in how far up the shore you go um, and how good the fishing is. Um, so instead of that clipped fish versus unclipped fish uh, fishing, uh, the catch rate, um, there are graphs that show the catch rate on the lower shore, the middle shore and the upper shore. Um, so like Duluth or like near the baptism or up by Grand Marais. And typically, uh, your catch rate goes up the further up the shore you go. Um, and that's kind of with everything. That's partially just a, um, there's less fishermen um, the further up you go, but it's it's worth, if you're going to make the drive, driving a little bit further and hitting some of those further north rivers are often worth it. Yeah. Got it in the back. Yep. Yeah, uh, so asking about the access on the Sucker River. Um, I didn't fish the Sucker this spring, um, but I know, so this is maybe a handful of years ago, the east side of the Sucker River is private, um, and there was an incident, now incident just like there's been incidences at the Brule where um, people did some bad stuff and uh, it closed down. I believe it it's roped off. I think he opens it in May. So I don't think you can fish uh, from Highway 61 to the mouth of the sucker um, in April. And then I believe he opens that up. I think it's May 1st, um, but I might be wrong. He usually puts a sign and rope. Um, so if you are just driving up the shore, and want to fish it, um, you can park at that angler parking parking on the east side of the sucker, um, and there should be a sign that says like "open this day" or yeah. But I think it, it is open; it's just a specific time. Um, I think it's just one side, but I can't remember if the other side's hard to access, um, so I can't remember exactly if it's yeah. I think the better fishing's from the east side anyways, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, yeah. Jason. What, oh. Just real quick, I was gonna ask you what rivers you like on the far north. Yeah. Um a lot of them. There's a lot of good ones. Um, personal favorite. I really like um, so don't don't go there, but <laughs> Uh, I like the Devil Track is one of my favorite rivers. It's real nice and like it's shale bottom. Uh, it's real clear, clear water as opposed to some of the stuff on the lower shore. It's like, you're like, how am I going to catch? It's even on its cleanest day, you have like six inches of visibility and that's all you're going to get um, just from, that's just the way it goes. But some of the upper shore rivers get a little clear. Um, I like fishing the Devil Track. It's fun. It's fast. It's dangerous. Um, it's like a switchback of canyons that if you're walking up, um, I've 
fallen in in the devil track before um just the water pushes you down if it's running above like uh, 180 200 cfs so you gotta be careful and you have to cross every time because you'll cross the river fish a hole and then there's a giant bank that you have to cross again to get to the next hole um but that it's a fun one to fish uh the cadunts the uh our chapter gichigumi chapter of trout and limit is has done a bunch of work on the cadunts and it's there's a bunch of nice uh step pools all the way up it's very accessible um takes a lot of fish um the brule river the arrowhead brule in minnesota um it's a good swinging spot so if you'd like to do two-handed stuff and are want to do some north shore stuff there's a couple rivers that are um a little better for that um but they all kind of have their their time in the place the the falls kind of a a fall a small one that i wouldn't spend much time it's a cool spot though um yeah do you like to move when you fish or do you like to push up i like to move um but it's it depends you got to kind of do what the fish are doing if you walk in and you catch a fish then it's hard to you don't want to leave fish to find fish so yeah okay uh jason we have cards we have flies over here hang around afterward yeah uh take check out his flies his rigs uh fly setups uh we have a little gift for you oh. <laughs> is this a welcome gift or a parting gift <laughs> yeah we'll figure it out call it a welcome yeah gift, i hope so thank, thank you, you jason Thanks appreciate Bob. you coming down Yes. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming out tonight supporting Trout Unlimited. Uh, one last thing, we do have a few spots left at our winter fish camp uh, at Whitewater State Park starting Friday night. If you are interested in that for the weekend, uh, let us know and we can get you signed back up. We do have a couple spots open. So thank you. Uh, safe travels. What's the score of the game? Three to three. So we haven't missed anything. So thank you. Oh yeah, Ricky.